there. Welcome to my cabin. I'm so glad you could join me today. Oh, you want a story? Well, I have a wonderful one for you. I hope you stay tuned and watch. Good morning and welcome to Lewis County Public Library's Lumo Storytime. We have a special story for you today that's about the history of Lewis County itself. Did you know that Lewis County is named after Meriwether Lewis? Yes, that Meriwether Lewis of the Lewis and Clark expedition that started at the Mississippi River, followed the Missouri till they reached the Pacific Ocean and back again. Well, our story today was written by me about snapshots of Meriwether Lewis's life. I hope you enjoy. Once upon a time, well, August 18, 1774 to be exact, a hero was born. Unlike many other heroes, this young boy was not to be the leader of a great war, though he did become a soldier, or a ruler of a great land, though he did become a governor. This hero earned his status as an explorer. In the first few years of his life, while his heroes fought for American independence, young Meriwether Lewis lived in rural Georgia. October 21st, 1786, a midnight hunt. The moon hung at its apex, shining full force on the forest surrounding the broad river. Young Meriwether carefully slid out of bed and crept to the door. It closed with the faintest creak. His faithful hunting dog, Scout, began to bound toward him, but Meriwether held up his hand to quietly stop the dog. Meriwether didn't really feel guilty about his nighttime hunt, but he knew his mother would worry. So while he wasn't breaking any rules, he also tried not to boast about his nightly adventures. He pushed past his shivers, signaled for his dog to heal, and cradled the rifle to his shoulder. The local Cherokee taught him a better way to trap, and he was positive the full moon would help. He was right. He could see better under the full moon. The closer Meriwether stalked to the broad river, the quieter he and his dog stepped. The coon had to be close. The dog froze beside him. Meriwether stopped as well, looking in the same direction. There was a beautiful raccoon. Deep inhale, he thought to himself. He sighted his rifle. A deep exhale. Squeeze, not pull. Crack! Scout raced towards the falling animal. Meriwether sighed happily. Perfect shot. He field dressed the animal, then hauled it back to the farm. It had a fine pelt that would fetch a lovely price with the traders maybe enough to buy a new book or paper for notebook. As he approached the house, Meriwether hoped he'd be able to sneak in as quietly as he snuck out, but that wouldn't happen. He heard the quiet voices of his mother and stepfather once he neared the door. John, please talk to the boy, Lucy pleaded. This is the fourth night in a row that he has snuck out. I know he can handle himself in the forest and most of the Cherokee are his good friends, but what if he gets hurt? What if someone or something attacks him? Peering through the crack in the door frame, Meriwether saw his stepfather hugging his worried mother. What would you have me say to the boy, Lucy? His stepfather replied. He gets his chores done, the pelts he sells help provide for the family, and he reads every book he can get his hands on. His mother waited a moment. Meriwether saw her slowly stand from the bed, pull a letter from her sewing kit, after reading the letter, he heard his stepfather ask, You want to send the boy to your brother in Virginia? Virginia? Meriwether was thrilled. Virginia held the greats like George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. If he lived in Virginia, he would have better schooling, new countryside to explore, and more. He began to raise his fist and jump for joy, but he quickly restrained himself. Virginia meant society, and society meant manners. He would have to place his best foot forward if he wanted this move to be successful. October 11th, 1801, the Corps of Discovery is born. Captain Lewis, the tall red-headed man seated at the fireplace greeted his secretary. Glad you could make it, come in. 
Meriwether Lewis, a captain in the United States Army and now private secretary to the president, dipped his head and entered the room. President Jefferson, the older man smiled in delight at the title. Have a seat. We have a new adventure to discuss. Meriwether folded himself almost in half to sit in the very low chair. He watched as Jefferson rummaged through a stack of papers, quickly handing him the right sheet. You're planning another trip west? Meriwether asked. He had met Jefferson several years before at 19 when the older man had first begun planning a Corps of Discovery. Jefferson nodded. They had great success finding waterways in Canada large enough for small ships. You've seen the Mississippi. If it continues further west, America could import goods from the Far East directly. With the lands being so different from Georgia up through Massachusetts, I can't imagine how many new plants will be out west, Meriwether said excitedly. Jefferson began rubbing his hands together in excitement and exclaimed, Some of the tradesmen have even reported seeing mastodons. Meriwether knew his good friend well. Jefferson's love of dinosaurs rivaled only his love of macaroni and cheese. There very well might be. Who knows how many different animals are out there? Jefferson looked at his young secretary steadily and asked, What do you think? Should I send a corps of the army west to explore? Meriwether nodded slowly. Military men, yes, but not a large group. My Cherokee friends have told me a little about the tribes living further west. Maybe a small group of 30 to 40 men? Yes, Jefferson replied. Men with a proven love of science who will bring back samples of plant and animal life? And record what is too large or delicate to bring back, Meriwether responded. And stubborn enough to make it as far west as possible and return home again, Jefferson said with eyebrows raised. Stubborn? I know just the man, Meriwether exclaimed. I've told you about my friend, Lieutenant William Clark. His spelling is terrible, but his map making skills are wonderful. And he's as stubborn as a mule. Lewis, Jefferson began seriously. I want you to lead my Corps of Discovery. Meriwether could hardly believe his ears. Nine years of hard work and dedication would finally pay off. He was going out west. August 11th, 1806, of shotguns and bears. Meriwether was in his element, clad in leathers gifted to him by one of the chiefs. He and his Newfoundland dog, Seaman, tracked elk along the Missouri River, hoping to be able to feed the men for a while. One of his men, Cruzette, was somewhere along the banks also hunting elk. The dog froze seconds before a beautifully big beast came into sight. Deep inhale, he thought to himself. He sighted his rifle. Deep exhale, squeeze, not pull. Crack! Agony, white, hot, fire! Cruzette, you have shot me! Meriwether screamed as he leaned against the tree, minding the gun lest he shot himself or seamen. The burning calmed ever so slightly. It felt like the wound was just at the top of his thigh. He wouldn't be sitting down for a while, that was certain. Cruzette should have answered by now, he thought. In this area, the locals might not be friendly. Meriwether ran, painfully, back to the docked boats. Glancing around and not seeing his hunting companion, he sent several of the men to search for the nearsighted hunter. Quick, he motioned for one of the remaining men to come to him. Help me bind this wound. I won't be able to run again like this. 20 minutes went by incredibly slow. All of the search party finally returned, Cruzette with them. The man looked sheepish, but not guilty. As they floated downriver, the bravest of the men managed to pull the bullet out. It matched Cruzette's gun, but he never admitted to mistaking his captain as a deer. Clark is not to hear of this, understood? Meriwether gritted out, glowering at each man in turn. Yes, Captain. Over 40 days later, the two groups met up again. They had split before the Marias River on the way back to cover more territory. Shouts of excitement quickly arose, exclamations of, 
you made it, and I broke a gun on a bear, filled the camp. All too soon, Merriweather heard the phrase he'd been dreading. He should have known the men wouldn't be able to keep the secret. The captain was shot. William Clark, Sacagawea, and her husband ran up to Merriweather. Clark spun the younger man around, inspecting him for active wounds. Where were you shot? Clark asked. Merriweather glared around the gathered men. Before he could answer, another man hollered, We think Cruzette shot him in the bum! The group was silent. Cruzette huffed in annoyance. And that led to the spluttering, giggling, knee slapping, eye watering, uproarious laughter. The phrase, shot in the butt, squeaked out after gulps of air. Merriweather turned and shouted in her tape, It was the upper thigh! That evening, Clark had convinced Merriweather to join everyone around the campfire. Despite their enjoyment of his discomfort, he wouldn't deprive them of his superior cooking. They had been successful in finding a path to the west, though it seemed like something did not want them to be. Hopefully, Merriweather's wound would be the last in a series of death-defying events. Three different falls left him hanging from a cliff face by his knife alone. And that wasn't counting all the skirmishes with the Native Americans. Then came the bears. He thought he knew bears. They had bears in Virginia. A bear might be the size of a normal man. Not as you get further west. No, sir. The western bears were giants. Several tribes had warned them of the grizzly bears. But until they saw one in person, they were not prepared for what they would find. After it took 10 shots to put the first grizzly on the ground, the respect for bears grew. If that weren't enough to put the fear of bear into the core of discovery, member Hugh McNeil's story did. McNeil took the spotlight as he told his bear adventure. So, I'm riding back to camp, head on a swivel, all seems fine. He held his body rigid, turning his head with the story. All of a sudden, my horse rears up so quickly, it's better to jump than try keeping my seat. The crazy thing runs away, and at first, I don't see it. He paused for dramatic effect. Looking at Merriweather, he continued, Cap, I know you said the bear that chased you into the river was massive, but this one had to have it beat. It was at least twice as tall as me and three times as wide. The gathered crowd, I swear this bear was the king of bears. He's on his haunches, ready to have a McNeil delight. I pulled up my gun, but he was too close to shoot. So do you know what I did? McNeil looked around the group, hands open. Come on, ask me. What did you do? The crowd asked, rolling their eyes. I reared back with my rifle and smacked the bear in the head with all my might. He fell back stunned. I climbed the nearest tree, hoping he would be too heavy for it. McNeil wiped his brow. Thank goodness I was right. When I tried to shoot the bear from the tree, my gun was broken. By dusk, the bear got bored and lumbered off. Sacagawea raised her hand. If the bear was twice your height, how did you hit him in the head? Merriweather was the first to laugh. With as many close calls as they had had with grizzlies, it was a wonder none of them had been hurt or eaten by the beast. Merriweather moved next to Clark some time later. Clark raised his head in question. Merriweather asked, how did we do it? How did we succeed? Clark studied his friend. He remembered all the times Merriweather had cooked, tended wounds, and faithfully listened. All the times a major decision had to be made when Clark wanted to make an immediate decision for the group, Merriweather insisted on letting everyone have a say before taking action. Lewis, Clark finally said, it has been Providence that we have made it. That and you're becoming the group father. <laughs> Merriweather chuckled lightly. He had become a dad to the group. He started out being protective of the 33 men in his charge. He became overprotective of the men after Sergeant Charles Floyd died of that mysterious stomach illness. Losing the one man had made him more determined to bring the rest home to their families. 
He did. October 11th, 1809. A mystery begins. The sun was setting as Meriwether Lewis paced the woods outside Grinder's stand. His mutters of greedy politicians and interfering military men could be heard from the cabin. It was no wonder the man was upset. He had been trying for three years to get his journals from the Corps of Discovery published, his personal funds reimbursed as promised from the government, and governing Louisiana despite the former governor trying to hold the position unofficially. His faithful dog, Seaman, pressed close to him. Together, they sat under a tree roughly 100 yards from the cabin. Oh, Seaman, I need the congressman to agree to pay back all the funds I spent for the expedition. Maybe then I'll be able to see Mother and celebrate Christmas with the family with an easy heart, Meriwether said wearily. The dog roughed a response. Meriwether chuckled lightly. Yes, after Christmas we will go back to St. Louis and you'll be able to see Clark's children. Maybe after I get the financials finished, I will finally be able to settle down, marry, and have a family of my own. As the sun drifted below the tree line, Seaman went to the barn to watch the horses and Meriwether went into the cabin. He opened the fur bedroll and settled down. Now he should have calmed his mind enough to drift off to sleep. He didn't. October 11th, 1842, a county born. Two men sat in the pre-dawn light around a campfire, complaining again about the lawmakers that lived so far away. Word had finally reached them about a new law that had nothing to do with life in the woods where they lived. Those highfalutin people in town don't have a clue what life is like out here, Mr. Gordon said to his friend, Mr. Sharp. Sharp spat. I hear ya. Those folks making all kinds of laws, but that don't mean nothing out here. I see more coyotes than I do people most days. They had plans to hunt along Little Swan Creek. After the hunt, they'd go out to the rundown stand and share a drink at the captain's grave. They respected men like Lewis. He lived in the roughest conditions and kept his men alive. I've been thinking about something, what with it being the anniversary and all. Gordon paused for a sip of chicory coffee. Just about everyone living around here that I know, the Carrolls, the McDonalds, the Blackburns, the Hensleys, and the others would rather be self-governing than deal with folk who don't even know them. Sharp huffed in agreement. What's this got to do with the anniversary? Gordon side-eyed his companion. What if we formed a new county named after him? You know of any other county named for Lewis? He died and is buried here. This place should be a memorial to him, Gordon mused while examining his rifle. My cousin is heading out west to one of the forts that's been built because of Lewis. He got a copy of a listing of plants that grow nearby. If it weren't for Lewis drawing those hundred-something crops, my cousin wouldn't have a clue what to farm. Oh, so the anniversary of his death has you thinking big thoughts again? Sharp knew that Gordon respected Lewis, but he also knew there was a lot of mystery over how he died. Gordon pointed a finger at his friend with authority. I know you believe what the papers say, but I'll tell you. I met Neely, the man who was supposedly there when Lewis died once. Shiftiest character I ever did meet. I wouldn't trust him if he said the sky was blue. Whatever Neely says about Lewis's death, I'll believe the opposite. Gordon's hunt wasn't very successful that day. Every time he would stand still, instead of focusing on the game, he focused on his plan. With the support of the people who lived nearby, he would ask the state government for a county in honor of Meriwether Lewis. It wouldn't have to be a big county, but he wanted Lewis to be at its center. And in December, 1843, he did. Thank you so much for joining us today for Lumo Storytime. If you are curious about some of the mystery around Meriwether Lewis's death, we hope that you enjoy. Please like, comment, share, follow our page for more videos, and we'll see you next week.